Hi, so after making my video about two years ago on this machine, I've now had it for another two years, so it's coming up to five years old. And since I made that original video, I've had many people ask me many questions about the machine. So what I thought I would do is make a follow-up video and answer all those questions in one video, and I'll timestamp the answers so that you can go straight to the question that you're most interested in. And so the first question that I want to answer is one that I'm going to pose on your behalf, and that is, am I still happy with this machine now that it's nearly five years old? Well, the answer is yes, I'm more than happy with it. It's been a great machine, it's still a great performer, and to be honest with you, if it broke down tomorrow, I'd go straight out and buy another one. Now, Adam asked me about the warm-up time. How long does it take for the machine to warm up when it's cold? And I've just made another video about that, so I'll, I'll put a link to that video in the uh, description section of this video. But the quick answer is it takes three minutes from when you push the on button to when it's fully up to temperature and ready to go. The important thing to note is you don't have to do that if you're using the machine at the same time every day as I do. All I do is I program it to come on 10 minutes before I get up in the morning. And so when I come to make my breakfast, it's all good to go for my first cup of coffee for the day. Ozzy Larrikin asked, where did I get this wooden handle? It's amazing how many people have asked about this handle and I can see why it's a great little bit of furniture. So I've put the link also to the website of the people that make these handles. Um, so you'll find that in the description section. Now, a number of people asked, can I use this machine for a commercial situation? Well, you know, selling coffee. And my answer would be, well, no, I wouldn't recommend it. Main reason is that it's a bit slow and you have to, you'd have to keep refilling the reservoir because there's no way to plumb this into the mains water system. So it holds 2.4 litres, which is plenty enough for your home use, but if you were just making continuous coffees out of it, you'd run out of water pretty quick. Plus the fact that when you steam the milk, it takes about one and a half minutes. And if you had all those processes together, I estimate the most you could make would be maybe 20 coffees in an hour, which is probably not enough for a commercial situation. And in any case, I'm not sure how it would affect your warranty. So all of that said, you probably could use it in a customer service environment where you've got a waiting room for um, people who are waiting maybe to see a, a lawyer or they're waiting at a, a car dealership in the waiting room. You could probably use it for that scenario and you'd probably get away with that. Tezza said, how do you know when the water tank is full? Well, that's a very good question because I, I showed you how to fill it when you open this flap at the front and explain that it's very convenient. You don't have to get around the back of the machine. But of course, how do you know when it's full? Well, how you know is down here underneath the group head, there's actually a, a um, fuel gauge and you can see the water filling up inside there. So it's very easy to see when it's full and obviously not overflow through the top. Johnny Appleseed asked me, how often do you descale? And my absolute honest answer is I've never descaled this machine. I've not had to do it because when you receive the machine, it comes with a little water testing kit and you can test the hardness of your water. And where I am, the water is very soft, meaning there's very uh, few minerals in the water. And so it doesn't tend to scale up machines. Uh, some people might say to me, oh, yeah, that's pretty reckless, but I've been running it for five years and I've never had a scale problem. So lucky, I guess, lucky to have a good water supply. Um, you, you, if you do the little test kit, it'll tell you how often you need to descale. So public name asked, how reliable is this machine? And I would say very reliable. After five years, I've had very few problems with this machine. As you know, I had to replace the handle on the group handle with this nice timber one, which I think looks better anyway. And also in the last two years, about a year ago, I had to replace the shower screen up inside the group head there. So that's just a little plastic screen that distributes the water evenly into the top of the group uh, handle and it cracked, so I had to replace it. And while I was in there, I decided to replace the silicon gasket that's in that group head as well. I didn't need to, but I did anyway. And it all up cost me about 20 bucks for that. So very reliable. One thing I would say though, is I did have some reliability issues right at the start. So the first machine I bought when I got it home, 
it wasn't storing the, in its memory the program settings that I put in. It would lose them after I turned it off and turned it on again. So I took that machine back. I got a replacement straight away. The second machine, it had a problem with dosing where it was overdosing the basket in the group handle. And so I had to take that back as well. And this is the third machine. So I put that down to sort of teething troubles with a new model because back then this was a brand new model and there weren't many of them out there. And I think it was just some problems with, with new design. So I would expect if you bought one today, you wouldn't have those issues. But if you do, that's what your warranty's for. PH asked about water quality after two weeks. Interesting name, PH, for a water quality question. So PH, I haven't noticed any difference, to be honest. Um, pH's concern was if you leave the water in the tank for two weeks, which is about how long it takes me to empty that tank, does it go off over the two weeks? And I've found that it doesn't. But then, as I said earlier, I have very good water quality here. So I would guess that maybe if you had water that wasn't chlorinated and it could have some microbes in it and they could flourish over time, over two weeks, and it could start to taint the taste of the water, maybe that could be a problem, but it's certainly not a problem when you're on good quality town water. Ben Piper asked, what are the cleaning requirements? Well, Ben, I've made a whole video about that, so I won't go through them all now. They're all in that video and I've gone through each one and how you do it. Joe asked, do you prefer boilers or thermoblocks? So if you're not sure what that question is about, this machine has two boilers in it. So that's the same technology that you'll find in any cafe machine, any commercial espresso machine. It's got a boiler that con uh, controls the water flow into the group head and it's got another boiler for the steam for your milk. Now, most home machines don't have boilers and that's one of the reasons this one is so expensive. The cheaper machines will have a thermoblock, which is a block of steel basically, and it gets heated up, superheated. There's a small channel that runs through it, and the machine pumps the water through that channel. And as it moves through the channel, it heats up. So when it gets out the other end, it's piping hot. But as I said in my earlier video, that's not a great system because you tend to get pulses of water rather than a continuous flow. So if you can afford a machine with boilers, definitely go for that over a thermoblock. Jean said, is that a power converter? And I think Jean was referring to this little box on the wall here. So no, it's not a power converter, it's a power filter. And the reason that's there is, this is what I do with any machine I have, anything, any appliance that I plug in, if it has a microprocessor in it to control it, I will always put it on a power filter because you're always gonna get power surges from time to time and a power surge can really knock out a microprocessor and then you've got to get a new machine basically so it's worth the 20 30 bucks whatever i paid for that filter to make sure that that doesn't happen we do get blackouts and brownouts and sometimes power surges so it's just a safety device really yana asked what type of tamper are you using and why so this tamper here you might say why do you need that because the machine does the tamping for you and that yes that's true it does but I always find, or not always, but sometimes I find there's some loose bits of coffee on the top of the puck, and I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I like to have that top of the puck polished off smooth. So I'm really using this not to compress the coffee, but just to smooth it off, to polish it. This is quite heavy. I don't know how much it weighs, but it's pro it feels like maybe you know 300 grams or something like that. And uh, so I don't put any weight on it. I just, I just sit it on top of the puck and I just turn it like that and it always does a good job. Uh, ben Piper, ben had, an early, ben had a few questions actually, so he, we're answering three of his in fact. Ben asked, what do you do with the leftover milk? Can you put it in the fridge and then reheat it? Well, I wouldn't recommend that. I just think it's going to be stale and I think you'll struggle to get it to texture up properly once you've done that because the proteins are to some extent being burnt by the first um, process and if you cool it and then try and reheat it I think you'll really struggle to get a microfoam so I wouldn't recommend that. What I would recommend is that you just put enough milk into your jug to make the one cup or two cups that you need to make. And depending on how many cups you need to make, that would determine the size of the jug that you use. 
Ben also asked, is it essential that you adjust the tamper fan? So Ben's obviously seen my video on the tamper fan adjustment, which I call tamper fan adjustment. It's really the dosing adjustment. So it determines how much coffee goes into that basket. And I think it's important to have that dialed in to the correct level. So I would say if your machine arrives and you know, you're getting, when you take, um, you put that in the grinder and you take it out of the grinder, if you're finding that there's about five or six millimeters of rim above the coffee, that's about where it should be. If it's a lot lower than that or higher than that, then yeah, I would be adjusting that at the start. You do it once, it's done. You don't have to keep doing it. So it's a bit of an effort, but it's well worth it. You'll get a much better shot. That's what I found anyway. Trevor. Trevor asks, do you need to change the grinder between brands and after beans dry out in the hopper? Good question. So yes, the answer is yes. I, I'm always just tweaking it. So on the left hand side here, there's the grind control for the coarseness. And if you turn that clockwise, you'll get a finer grind. And if you turn it anti-clockwise, you'll get a coarser grind. Between brands of coffee, you'll find that it has to be adjusted. And also even the same beans, if they've been sitting in this hopper, as they sit there, they dry out. So they won't be the same on day three as they were on day one. And you'll find they're drier. And so therefore you'll need to tighten up your grind a little bit. And I'm, I am talking little bits here. I'm talking you know, probably less than a quarter of a turn, maybe a quarter of a turn. So not a lot, but you'll find you just have to tighten it up as it dries out. And then when you put fresh beans in, you might have to back it off a little bit. The thing is, over time, you'll get very used to this, very adept at it, and you'll just know where it needs to be. There is a gauge on the machine that shows you, but I never even look at it. I just, I do it by feel. Ken. Uh, he pointed, Ken did me a favor actually, he pointed out on, in my video, I forgot to mention that there's a hot water spout at the back here, just behind where the group head is. There's a little spout. So when you're making your Americano coffee or what we in Australia call your long black, you can take your shot, pull the shot, and then you can push a button here to supply water, hot water out of that spout straight into the cup. And that's how you bring it up to the, the right level. So uh, thank you for pointing that out, Ken. Now the boss, <laughs> don't know if that's Springsteen, but anyway, the boss asked, how important is water quality? And I mentioned this earlier. It's important, I would say, but not as important as some people think. You don't have to have completely pure as a driven snow water. And in fact, you don't want to be using distilled water in the machine or water that's been through some sort of osmosis process because what happens is that takes every mineral and everything out of that water and all that's left is H2O. And in actual fact, pure water doesn't make the best coffee. You actually need some of that mineralization in there to bring out the flavors of the coffee. So don't go overboard with it. If you've got a decent town water supply, that's fine. I used to live in a place where I was on tank water before I moved here. So for the first two years, I was using this on tank water and it worked fine there as well. Yaniv asked, does your payback calculation include the cost of milk, electricity, consumables, etc.?" Yes, it does. When I did that payback calculation, I added in all of those things, consumables and extras, and that's what it came out to. Fitz. Fitz asks, the main difference, or what is the main difference between the Oracle and the Oracle Touch? So this is the Touch model. There's also one, a cheaper model called the Oracle that doesn't have the LCD display and it doesn't have touch controls. It's all done with knobs and buttons. My son owns that model and it's a great machine. I go to his place and it makes a great coffee. Um, the only difference is really that this one's just a slightly nicer interface and it's got more programmable functions. So if you're running it with lots of different people in the house and you want to save everybody's preferences, this is probably the better machine. But to be honest with you, if I was buying another one now, I wouldn't buy this. I'd buy the, the straight up Oracle because I only, you know, I've only got a couple of programs in there and I'd never change them. So it's the same coffee every day. So programming is not a thing for me. 
and it's a big difference in price. It's a thousand dollars difference between this one and the one without the LCD display. That's a huge difference. So I would not buy it. Sorry, Breville. Uh, I should say, by the way, I don't get paid for doing any of this by Breville and I don't, I don't make money really out of YouTube. So when I give an opinion, it's just what I think. Jin said, what grind setting do you use? And Jin was asking me for the details exactly of where on the scale the grinder is set. And I pointed out that that's really meaningless because as I said earlier, it depends on the state of the beans that are in the hopper. So me telling you a setting and then you putting that into your machine is not gonna help you. Don asked, is the grinder good enough? So a couple of people have asked this question. Uh, they say, oh, do you need to have a, buy a separate grinder because there have been a few comments from people that Breville's grinders are not great. And I know exactly what they mean because I used to have a manual machine, a Breville machine that didn't have a built-in grinder. So I bought the separate grinder as an accessory and I was really disappointed with the performance of that grinder. I couldn't get it sort of to go fine enough. So I finished up getting rid of that and I actually spent a lot of money on a commercial grinder just for that machine. And of course that improved the result, but it was an expensive solution. I will say, however, the grinder in here works really, really well. It grinds, it's got a good range of, of adjustments. You can get it as fine as you need or as coarse as you want, and it keeps going and it doesn't clog up, so it's a perfectly good grinder. No need to buy another one. Gerard asked, is there an auto setting, oh sorry, is there an auto on setting and how long does it stay on for? So as I said earlier, yes, there is an auto setting to pro where you can program the machine to come on at the same time every day or even different times throughout the day. So yes, how long does it stay on? It will stay on for an hour approximately after it comes on and then it'll turn itself off. Peter asked, the, what is the height from the tray to the porter filter? So in other words, what Peter wanted to know was how big a cup can you get underneath that group head? And the answer to that is that it's 100 millimeters from the tray to the group handle. If you get a cup and you tilt it, you can get a 120 millimeter cup into that space. That's a reason, reasonably si reasonable size cup, but if you wanted to put your traveler mug, like I do, in under there every morning, it wouldn't fit. And so what I do is I use this double walled espresso cup to put under there and take my shot in there and then I transfer that shot into my traveler mug and that's how I, I deal with that. Omicron, hmm, I thought he'd gone. <laughs> Omicron asked, what is the difference between single and double shot? Yeah, so the real difference is actually the infusion time. So I can't remember exactly because I always double shot and that's 30 seconds on this machine. I think it's, you know, 20 seconds for a, a single shot when you select single shot on here. And basically the idea there is that the, when you put your coffee in here into the basket, you're gonna use a smaller basket for a single shot. So this is a double shot basket and holds about 23 grams of coffee, which is a large dose for, a, for a, um, any espresso machine. And I think the small one, the, the single shot, holds somewhere around 17 grams of coffee. So the idea is that your infusion time, your shot time on the clock, it will be 30 seconds on with the big basket and let's say it's 20 seconds with the small basket and the idea is that what you're aiming for is to get in your shot glass double the weight of the dry ground, ground coffee that's in there so if you want to get technical with it you need to weigh the amount of coffee in the basket multiply it by two and then weigh your shot when it's finished on your scales and it should be roughly double. So I'm looking to get, uh, if that's a 23 gram basket, I'm looking to get say 46 grams of liquid in there over 30 seconds. If, it, if you get the right uh, weight after that right amount of time, then that will give you the perfect shot. It won't be too fast, which would make it sour and, and weak and it won't be um, tarry and bitter if it's too slow. TVD asks, how long does it take to steam the milk? I think I answered that earlier. It takes approximately 1.5 minutes to, to finish that cycle. Dan asked, 
Have you had any warranty issues? Well, yes, Dan, I mentioned that earlier. I did have two that failed out of the box straight up and they were replaced straight up. Joe asks, is it okay to leave the beans in the hopper overnight? Again, this is a thing that people get really stressed about and I don't know why because um, I don't find it to be an issue. I mean, I will, I will use the beans in that hopper over a two or three days and in that amount of time, they're not going off. There's no real issue. The, the, the last coffee is as good as the first, but as I said, you do need to tweak your grinder because it'll they'll start to dry out and it'll the, the water will start to flow too fast and you'll get the problem I was just talking about where it comes out sour. So you'll just have to tighten up your grind a little bit. Imogen asked, how long does the grind take? Yeah, so Imogen, it takes, uh, I, would, I haven't actually um, measured this, but I would say it takes about 30 seconds to grind. So it's not the fastest grinder in the world. And again, this is why when you add the grind time and the milking time and the shot time and everything together, it's not really suited to commercial environment. But when you're just making coffee at home, it's, it's fine. It is quite, quite loud when it's grinding, but uh, it's, it's not, not too bad. So the last question I left for the boss again, he's back, the boss. And he asked, so if you wanna be a real coffee nerd, uh, is this all the info you need or is there more? And I left that to last because I want to leave you with this thought, like don't ruin your coffee experience by stressing about whether you've got the exact amount of dose in the cup or the exact amount of weight in the, in the uh, group basket or you know the temperature's right or the water temperature's right or the water might be too old or whatever. You can drive yourself mad with these small things and there are all these videos on YouTube that are just gonna um, turn you into, stre into a stress bubble before you even start making coffee because you're, you're fearful that you know, something's gonna go wrong. The fact of the matter is that if you look at your cafe, those guys are just plowing through the coffees at a rate of knots and they're not measuring everything every time they make a coffee. So there's gonna be human error in there and yet you, know, you sit down, you drink your coffee, it's a nice pleasant experience. It should be that way at home as well. So don't geek out on all this stuff. Um, I would say, um, the first thing is start with good coffee beans. So don't, don't uh, scrimp on your, your coffee beans, get good quality beans and fresh beans. That's the, probably the most important thing. And then the rest of it is, you know, start with the default settings in your machine and you'll probably find that that makes a perfectly good coffee. But after you've made a few, if you think, oh, you know, this probably needs to be tweaked a bit because it's coming out too fast. I need to tighten the grind a bit. That's fine, you know, do that for sure. But don't get in there with all sorts of weird and wonderful devices, you know, trying to measure things and get it spot on because, uh, you know, you can change it. There's an infinite number of settings you can change in here with water temperatures and milk temperatures and all sorts of stuff. But really the default stuff were, the settings work pretty well. And I've never had a disappointing coffee out of this machine. So I will leave you with that for now. I hope this has been helpful. As I say, I'm gonna timestamp all those questions for you. If there's anything I haven't answered and you want to know the answer to it, feel free to drop me the question in the comments section. I'd be surprised if there's anything that no one else has thought of, but you know, if there is, that's great. And meanwhile, I hope you enjoy your coffee. Give me a thumbs up if you like the video and I hope to see you in the next one. Take care.